want to fend for myself, and I, I want to build people up for them to fend for themselves. Welcome back to the Free Like Me podcast. I'm your host, Clark Fredericks. And today I have a special guest that I'm very excited about, a former jail guard slash corrections officer who worked at the facility I was held in for three and a half years. His name is Derek Pivko. We developed quite a friendship while I was there. Go figure in that environment. And uh, I want to share how we uh, got our friendship going and I want to share some trauma he's had in his life and let him speak his truth and at the end be free like me. Welcome, Derek. Thank you, Clark. Thank you for the introduction. So good seeing you as well. Yeah, man. Let's dive right into uh, how we met. Obviously... I sink to a low, murder my abuser, my sexual abuse uh, uh, animal who abused me, and I am held first-degree murder in the Sussex County Jail, also known as uh, Keo Dwyer facility. And you come on during my last year there as a new guard. Um, And when guards... Corrections officer slash guards, forgive me if I, you know, say that. Uh, but when guards, you know, come on for a new shift, you have to come around and do cell checks. Mm-hmm. And you would come on and come to my cell to do a cell check and and then just hang out and talk to me like a human being. And uh, did you know my story when you first came in? Uh, I knew it very well. Uh, I came from a journalism background. I worked for Fox 11 News out in Tucson, Arizona. And something about me is I always do my research before I came in. Your story, it was national news as well. And more importantly, being in Sussex County, not a lot goes on in our area. Your story was all over New Jersey Herald. So I was doing my research on you. And I felt like I knew you prior to coming in. So once I was able to connect the story to the face, I was like, okay, this is the individual. So that's, I felt like I knew you well before I I met you. And and did you like... All right, so you would come in to do your cell check, and then you'd end up hanging out for like a half hour in my cell, you know, <laughs> bullshit with me. You know? And I'd have to say to you, like, uh, you know, you got to do a, all the cells on the, uh, on the on the floor, right? And he's like, yeah, 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 I'll get to him. I mean, were, were you were you trying to gauge my my mental state? Were you just trying to be a human being? Like, what? It's not like you were going to every cell and hanging out for a half hour. You'd right. never get anything done, but. What what was your what were you thinking when you would would come to my cell? Yeah, I think if I was doing the thirty minute talk to everybody, I think I would still be there. Right, right. <laughs> I think the downfall is the jail's now closed too, so um, I'd be there by myself. But um, for you, just I just felt I didn't feel felt like you're an inmate. It feels like just somebody I already knew. So talking to you just was uh, my debriefing. I knew I was going to be there for any time between eight and sixteen hours. I felt safe around you in a, in a correctional facility, which is hard to hard to talk about, but. Yeah. With you, it just it just felt like as if you're you're kind of like a friend there. You know, I when I when I got shipped out to prison, I went to a place called Craft first. Mm-hmm. Before, and you know, you get a, you know, they got to decide which prison they're going to send you to. And I was in this place called Craft, and it's a hellhole. And the guards there are just brutal, like ready to ready to just beat you at any any moment. And, and on the night before I shipped out of there to go to Northern State Prison, you know, the 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 officer on duty came and like threw a garbage bag in my cell and he's like, Pack all your stuff up, bring it to my desk, you're shipping out in the morning. So I get down there and there's four other inmates ahead of me. They all give their bag and he labels them. And then I get there and I give him my bag and, and he goes to me, uh, Fredericks. And this guy, like, he, he was tough as nails. <laughs> and he's like, Fredericks, mind if I ask you what you're doing here? And so I give him, a, like, a minute version of, you know, getting molested and raped by, you know, I said, and he was a corrections officer. Mm-hmm. He was a lieutenant. And uh, then I tell him, you know, I ended up murdering. And he sits back in his chair, and he's rocking in his chair. He's got his hands behind his head. And he's like, that's all right by me, Fredericks. It's all right. <laughs> and I said to him, I go, can I ask you a question? He's like, yeah. And I go, why did you ask me and not the other four guys in front of me, you know, what they were here for? Why did you pick me? And he's like, you're different. There's something about you. I can tell you're different. I was like, huh. And that 
That goes into what you're just saying there. Right. Even though I was in there for murder, you, you just said you felt safe with me. Yeah. No, no qualms at all. Did you, did you, when you came on, did you like check with any of the other officers that worked there to be like, Hey, is this Frederick's guy uh, on the up and up? Is he cool? Yeah. So when I started, I, they did uh, the training. I'm trying to be nice about it, but right. um, <laughs> the training was minimal. Uh, right. That's being very nice about it. I think I had like an hour and a half. And afterwards, like, all right, the person I was supposed to train with was going to be out. So someone else got it very last minute. And the person said, all right, we'll just uh, send him and see how he does. So I was kind of like thrown to the wall. So That's I, it, huh? Yeah, it was great. But um, I think I was, I think you were 4B, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I was on 5R, 5, five right. Okay, yeah. 5 right. So that's that's where you were. Yeah. So I just remember saying, hey, is that Clark on this floor? He's like, yeah, he's right up there. And um, I just remember I was with uh, one of the officers, and I remember you came out of the cell. I'm like, okay, this is, uh, this is Fredericks. And I was just, my first time out there. And I was trying to like canvas the area, and I was looking at the, um, uh, you're going to know this uh, better than I would. Like, say, for example, if you need needed to buy soap or candy, I want to know how that works. So you actually... You just show me like, oh, this is how I get like a candy bar. So that was actually our brief introduction. I doubt you remember that. But I just wanted, I was just so inquisitive about the entire area. Once I met you, I was like, okay, so this is who he is. This is where he's going to be. And then just uh, after that, I got to end up seeing him most of the time. My first two weeks, I did uh, the seven to three shift. Uh, that's usually the senior officers that are mainly there. And then afterwards, I did the uh, overnight shift, the uh, seven to 11. And then most of the time, I ended up doing uh, the, uh, mandatory overtime too so i would see you in the morning as well so i saw you before you went to bed and i saw you right when you got up right right at 6 30 in the morning yeah <laughs> those lights must be brutal every morning <laughs> uh, i i i came to curse those overhead lights man they, that they had a hum to them mm -hmm. and it, it, it was just like demonic to me like the hum of that light would wake me up and i would just start cursing my day um, you know, I was in a, I was in a bad state for a while, you know, while I was there and, you know, I eventually said, I, I got to start healing myself. Right. And, uh, so you're coming in, into the cell, you know, on a regular basis, just hanging out, talking to me like a human being. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in that environment with what I was facing, you know, uh, that meant the world to me, you know, like you're not treating me like a piece of garbage, you know, you're treating me like a human. And, uh, you know, so we developed, uh, uh started to develop a friendship just from all these talks you know, <laughs> all the time. And, and I recall I was, you know, getting ready to ship out to prison and I'm like, I got to talk to this guy. <laughs> and you came into the cell and I'm like, Derek, I got to talk to you. And... He literally did say Derek. It wasn't <laughs> typical like how yeah. what they normally say. <laughs> yeah, we're not supposed to know first names uh, <laughs> while we're in there, you know. Uh, but I said, hey, dude, I got to say something to you. Please don't take offense to this. And you're like, yeah, we're talk. <laughs> and I'm like, I talk. <laughs> and I'm like, you are way too nice for this job, man. I said, this job is going to kill you. <laughs> I said, you got to find a different job. You're like, really? I'm like, yeah, man. I go, ah, don't do it, man. <laughs> and then I ship off to prison. I get out of prison. I get on Facebook. And all of a sudden, I get a friend request from you. Uh, this and... guy. <laughs> <laughs> I can't shake this guy. He won't leave me. <laughs> and uh, you send me a private message. And you're like, I took your advice and I left. Just tell, you know, like, so what, you know, what were you thinking? And what did, did you like? Did you hear me? And then, like, the jail was closing, and you're just like, yeah, maybe this isn't what I want to be doing. Yeah, so uh, working in a jail is not the best environment for anybody, whether you're an inmate or you work there as well. Uh, morale, it was shattered all the time. You never knew when you were going home as well. You get stuck with mandatory. You didn't have a life. Your your life was working in the jail no matter what. And then um, I remember everyone saying – I was one of the new guys, and they were saying, oh, uh, we're going to be closing eventually. And that was just an everyday conversation. And that was just saying, all right, this is something's not right with it. And then um, I remember getting stressed out. I actually had a idea how to get injured at the facility just to go on disability as horrible as that sounds. It just, I've had enough of it. And when I was thinking about it at the time, I was like, that's not normal. You don't want to talk about self harm at a facility. But um, my plan was, you know, those wonderful stairs that you went up down back all the time. My plan was to get my uh, leg trapped on it and snap my ankle going up the stairs. <laughs> wow. I just, I just could not do that. And once I had that going on in my mind, like when you have a plan, that that's scary. Yeah. 
And then um, once I thought that, I was like, you need to get out of here. Uh, I remember your conversation very well. I remember I, sh- I actually shook your hand the, the day before you went. Um, actually, two days before you went, because I went to a Ranger game the day that you went to uh, Kraft. So I just remember feeling horrible saying, oh, Clark's on his way to Kraft, and I'm going to Madison Square Garden. And I just remember feeling guilty about that, saying, oh, I just hope – I remember saying, I'm going to pray for you as well. Oh, thanks, bro. And I just remember shaking your hand, and it turns out I got I got right up that day too because you're not supposed to shake an inmate's hand. <laughs> So it was somewhere in the policies, and I just didn't. I just didn't care because right, right. you're different. Yeah. So you leave. We reconnect. I mean, how? Let, let's just go back a second. Like <laughs> that environment is so bad for your soul. Is it, and it's probably not even necessarily the inmates. <laughs> like it's probably more like. The environment and the, who you're working with, and it's backstabbing. Is that is that the environment? Like that's exactly what it is. So it's, it's like dealing with the inmates was probably a breath of fresh air. That was actually right? the best part of my day. Really? <laughs> yeah. The co-work, like, don't get me wrong, I I'm still friends with a good portion of my the coworkers, but there's a reason why I stopped talking to about eighty percent of them. So I get out. You you find me on uh, Facebook. I do some speeches. You and your mom come mm-hmm. to them. You support me. Um, you end up getting married last year and you invite me to your wedding, mm-hmm. you know, and I made a post about it and people are like, you got to be kidding me. A, a jail guard who was in charge of <laughs> reprimanding you is inviting you to your wedding. I'm like, yep. Uh, and, but where I want to go with that is uh, there was, there was another, you know, corrections officer, you know, at your wedding. Yep. And I told him the story because he's like, what the heck are you doing here? <laughs> you probably had the same question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I told him, you know, about how we met. You would, you know, hang out in a cell. And then I told him, you know, like uh, I said, this job is going to chew you up. This isn't for you. You're too nice of a right. guy. And and the guy actually said to me, he's like, I wish somebody had told me that. He goes, because I've been in it and the same, that's what happened to me. He yeah. goes, he goes, it chewed me up and I'm jaded. He goes, mm-hmm. I'm a jaded person right now. I admit it. He goes, and the job did that to me. Yeah. So. Thank God you got out of that environment. Oh, thank you. When, when you're thinking of snapping your own ankle to get out of a, that's a that's a pretty uh, scary situation. Yeah. I was gonna do it in, at night when there's no lights. This looked like it would be a freak accident. Man, mm. that's uh, to, to to get your mind into that 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 mindset. Yeah. That, that's frightening. And that thank God you realize like. Holy smokes! Look what I'm thinking of doing to myself just to get out of the work. Yeah, and I, got- I thought about the medical bills. I'm like, no, 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 I can't afford that either. <laughs> <laughs> At the low correctional officer rage. <laughs> wow, it's got to be a hellish environment. Yes. Man. <laughs> oh, thank God you got out of that. Yeah. yeah, bravo. So, so uh, you know, we see each other. Uh, you know, at the wedding, uh, it was great. You know, I was honored to be there. Um, and, and what was it? Was it a year ago when you when you had this uh, traumatic event happen in your life, or was it uh, two years ago? Uh, Labor Day, two thousand twenty-one. Two thousand twenty-one. So, so I'm gonna I'm gonna give it to you now, and, yeah. and tell me what you're doing, and and you know, tell the audience what happened. Okay, uh, it just happened to be a random day. I worked at Lake Mall Country Club. I was the co-op director. So uh, Labor Day is usually the best day of the year because afterwards the guards are done for the year and I don't get 30 phone calls on an hourly basis, which is nice. Uh, it got to the, to my office about an hour early. I had it, a plan of what I wanted to do. I know one of the docks at one of the beaches uh, with the chains broke free, so I, that was all my plan. I had an idea who I was going to bring with me. Just to, it, was, it would take like an hour's work, and I was just planning out my day. I said, fix the dock, and then just uh, do the uh, your occasional round. Six o'clock will come, and we're We'll have, we'll have dinner together, and then we'll call it a season. Uh, that didn't happen. So at around 11.25, I got a phone call from uh, one of my guards saying that she was in a car accident. And I was like, okay. Um, one, I can be, I'm can be. i at the age where I could have a kid close to that age. And I said, are you okay? You don't have to come into work. She says, I'm fine. It wasn't my fault. And I will be there around 12.15, 12.20. I'm like, it's your call. And then all of a sudden, five minutes later, I saw on West Shore Trail, three police officers come flying down our road. When I say flying, West Shore Trail is about a road that's speed limit of 25 miles per hour. They're going about 50. Right. They're going over speed humps. They, it's, it looks like the car, if the cars could fly, they were flying on West Shore Trail that day. 
I had no idea what that was, but when I knew three cars were flying down West Shore Trail, I knew it wasn't something out of the ordinary. This was something else. And I just remember saying, I, whatever's going on, I hope they're okay. 30 seconds later, I got a phone call from uh, Rich Carlson. He is the head of Marine Services there, and he said that we have a missing swimmer in the lake at a residential property on West Shore Trail. You need to get all your cards, and they need to get to the beach. Uh, we had a little issue with that because our radios were practically dead at the time. We needed to replace all the radios, and I figured, hey, end of the summer, nothing's going to happen. Oops. Oh, boy. So um, I'm trying to radio everybody, and I'm not getting any calls. I got uh, my uh, my assistant, who just turned 18 a, a week prior to that. She was my uh, my head lifeguard that day, an 18-year-old. Right. Remember that? Yeah. So um, I said, all right, you're going to East Shore Trail. I'm going to get all the guards from West Shore Trail. We're going to meet at this property. They were right by the, uh, right by the bridge on West Shore Trail, and we end up getting everybody. I remember being livid because the radio wasn't working. I remember I threw my radio down on my car and on my uh, passenger seat, and it smacked me in the face. I was just so frustrated. I threw it and it bounced back. I'm like, all right, don't do that again. But um, <laughs> we got to the we got to the place, and I talked to the guards saying we have a missing swimmer. All of you guys are coming with me. Uh, initially, I made a error, and I initially said it was an eight-year-old. Okay, it was an eighty-year-old. So that was like a little minor glitch on me, and I corrected it right before. I said, "We're training what we're doing. We're going to be doing a deep water search. We're going to split you guys into groups of two. You're going to be in the water for about six minutes, and afterwards, you're going to you're going to switch out." We had uh, thirteen guards on scene. So, so you guys are actually responsible for finding the body. Yep. Yeah, uh, the reason why is uh, lifeguards are the first responders for the facility. And then uh, state police were being uh, from they were they have a di- dive and rescue team. They are based in Parsippany. Right. They are being transported over via helicopter to our facility. They were going to be at not Hell Morgan School, whatever the school is right next to PNC Bank and Sparta. It's totally just went out of my mind. I okay. remember at ten o'clock tonight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it was our responsibility to uh, take a look, and whenever the state police came, they would take over the scene. All right, so now you say you had to round up everybody. Yep. So what ages are we talking that you're rounding up? We are talking about uh, people who are sophomores and seniors in high school. You're talking about the ages from 16 to 18. And that's who has to now get with you into the water to search for a body. Correct. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's not a good scenario yeah, but it's for what, anybody. It's what we were trained to do. We got in the water, and one of our member, one of our Marine Patrol officers, he is a avid fisherman. And he has a fish finder, which is radar. So he found like this long black line. And what 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 depth of water are we talking? We uh, we were initially when we we when we started the deep water searches, it was about ten feet. But really? at the same time, it is so hard to see. It's so hard to measure down there because it's dark down there. I can't see my hand in front of me. I'm trying to look for something that. So I you're can diving even see. down to the bottom to feel on the ground. Yep, we had in our a, uh, in a line. Yep. Wow. Yeah, we basically spread out like a T width, so basically arms apart, just so we're not like clocking each other by mistake. We go down there. We had our mask and fins. We were able to see towards the bottom, but we're having trouble finding. We were in the water for about five minutes, and then uh, one of our Marine Patrol officers came by, and he drove with the uh, rangefinder, and he saw this long black line, and he realized what it was. And Rich Carlson, our head of uh, Marine Services, he swam over there, and he yelled for me. He said, keep the guards over there. And he, I swam with him, and my my supervisor, Rich, he said, point down, and he knew what, what it was. I froze. It was the longest second of my life. I've never frozen in my life or anything. And I just remember Rich looked at me, and he went down because he realized that I was acting up. And he went down. He brought out the body. When I saw the body, I can paint that picture to this very day, exactly what he was wearing, his haircut, the, the his uh, grayish his gray skin matched his uh, jumpsuit that he was wearing that day as well. Wow. Yeah. People say to me, like, you know, how can you remember in such detail the sexual abuse you suffered at such a young age? Right. And when things are traumatic, mm-hmm. they, they become ingrained in your mind. They're vivid. Yeah. Like, I can't tell you anything about my 10th, 11th, 12th birthday. I can tell you about the sexual abuse in detail. Mm-hmm. And that's what you're facing now with this situation is – Every little detail about about the victim is now ingrained in your mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So so Rich brings him up to the surface of the water. He was able to bring him up by himself. Right. And and then and then now what? We have to get him into a boat. No. So uh, what we did or we is swim the shore with him. He, uh, he drowned in seven feet of water. 
Right. Uh, what happened was uh, the it was Labor Day 2021. It was just like a beautiful day. Uh, it was like not cl- there. There was supposed to be rain the very next day. So uh, I'm not sure if he lived there year round because a lot of the houses on the lake are seasonal. I'm pretty sure he lived there year round. But he was uh, putting a cover on his boat because we were supposed to get rain the very next day, and he wanted to do it during a beautiful part of the day. And uh, something happened. Uh, he couldn't get the tarp in, and he fell overboard. He can't swim. He oh, never yeah. learned how to swim. I believe that his uh, wife was actually a Olympic qualifier for swimming many years ago. And she, she's an Olympic qualifier and mm-hmm. never like gave her husband swim lessons. I, I've, I've never been in their house before. Right, right. But um, oh, she went to call nine one one. Tragedy. She went to call nine one one. By the time that she got off the phone, he was gone. Wow. Uh, we had a when we got to the scene that uh, we had a couple of police officers in the water. We also had a lot of volunteer or a lot of neighbors who were on the boats who, or kayaks and who saw what was going on. They tried to help us as well. Uh, when Rich and I realized we were in an issue because uh, we're when we found them, we were in a rocky, a lot of rocks on the bottom of the floor, and we had fins on. When you're wearing fins and you're kicking the rocks, you're going to do harm to your to your feet as well. And we realized that a couple of our guards didn't have their fins with them. So we decided, all right, well, we need help bringing this body over as well because we can't do it by ourselves, especially with the equipment that we have on. So once we got to our area, we switched them over to the guards who didn't have the fins, and they brought them over. Uh, Sparta EMS were there. They retrieved the body, and then we took him out of the water. He was uh, dead on arrival. So um, he was underwater for about 37 minutes, I believe. Wow. And we had, once we got off, once we all got out of the water, we had a uh, meeting with all the guards and said, hey, this is what happened. This is what we trained for as well. And fortunately, we had to do our training today. Uh, we have a couple options. We can close the beaches and go home, or we can go back to our beaches and try our best to go on with the day. And guards at the time saying, yeah, we'll go back to the beaches. These are sophomores, juniors, sophomores, seniors, juniors, seniors. Saying, we'll go back. Yeah, they, okay. didn't, they didn't know any better. Yeah. Uh, about 25 minutes later, I got a call from one of the guards saying one of our guards is in the porter potty and he refuses to come out. So uh, we realized that this was, one, it was one person, and that person started growing to other people as well. They couldn't operate. So I called our general manager at the time and says, hey, we have to close. We're not operating. I remember going to one of the beaches, and I was crying on my way to one of the beaches just to get them out of there as well. And we all decided to meet at the office Rich Carlson, who I've said it several times already, is a retired sergeant, or I think he might be. I think when he retired, he was a lieutenant for Leonia, and he did a lot of uh, trauma over the over the years. So he did a uh, trauma exercise. Uh, one of our members is a uh, psychologist as well. She was talking to Rich about advice as well. She happened to be in Colorado at the time, but she said, "Hey, I'll be on speaker the entire time for anything." So we all met at the office, and they. We were obligated for them to call the parents to let them know where they were and what what happened as well. And we gave them information, and he says, hey, uh, what our insurance does is we're going to be able to pay for two counseling services. After uh, two counseling, uh, and they realize that they still can't get connect, uh, we'll, we'll do more with them. Uh, when you give a, a 16-, 17-, or 18-year-old information, piece of paper, they lose it. Right. So uh, parents are starting to call us saying, our kids are having nightmares. I know that you gave us something. We need to know what it was. So once we realized that it was more than one that were missing, we did a parent service uh, about two nights later. So we gave the same information. Our channel manager was there. Our controller, Rich, was there. Uh, Butch Valentine as well. He's a Marine Services officer too. And myself, we all explained the situation as to what happened and what's eligible for them as well. So that's uh, that's what happened that day. But um, it was brutal for me because I'm the supervisor. Right. And uh, being a supervisor is you're in charge of 16, 17, 18 year olds. And in my head, I'm playing that day. I have the director's cut of that day all in my head, and it goes on all the time. So I just remember I I can paint the picture of the guy coming up from the water, and it's something that will probably never uh, get out of my mind. I've gotten better with it, yes, but it's just uh, something that will live with me forever. All right. And it's not like he had a heart attack or anything and fell in the water. No. He just, he went, slipped off the boat and just didn't know how to swim and drowned right. that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's horrible. Wow. So when, the, when the kids did, did it like domino effect when the one kid wouldn't come out of the port john and then like, was it, was it like, you know, measles spreading, you know, just boom, 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 boom. Yep. 
you know, the first one went, and then all of a sudden two of them were uh, were saying we can't do this either. And then uh, here's the here's the, here's the thing where I lost it. I lost my cool that day on that for a different reason. There was a party at one of the beaches, right. and I made an announcement saying that we're closing. We had the drowning. We can't operate. I got a call from one of the parents saying, I heard you had a drowning. Do you want another one? There's kids in the water right now, and you're sending the guards home. What is wrong with you? And I practically almost threw my phone in the where I was, and I was just all right. get the kids out, get, the, get, the, get, the, get them out of there. And then I decided I'll go there later. I knew one of my guards was home from college. I gave her a call and said, hey, go up to this beach. Just watch the water for a little bit. I'll be there when I can. And I called the general manager. I said, hey, this beach uh, just went livid on me, and I'm giving a heads up in case they call because I'm sure I said something that I would regret. And actually, now to think of it, I don't regret it at all. Um, then after— So they they were livid that you would dare stop their party yeah. just because of a drowning? Yep. Right. <laughs> yeah, they were drinking at the time. Their beer muscles were going on. Right. And I just made a mental note of that is— the day after this after this incident, I'm going to make them well known. All right. Wow. So, did your uh, general manager back you? Yep. In your decision. Yep. He would say, "Whatever you got to do, we'll take care of it for you." Um, my downfall was is I wanted all the kids to get to get help first. So I was the way I put it is I gave my life jacket and gave it to somebody else to rescue them first because I always felt that the kids should go first and then I'll go to myself later. Uh, I was at the time where I was in college as well. I was finishing up my uh, cybersecurity degree. Mm -hmm. I was about at the midway point. And I just remember I had a homework assignment due that day. And I couldn't couldn't even remember my password to log onto my computer. I was so stressed. I'm like, I don't even, I can't operate. I don't know my password. So it was just, it's, I don't, I don't like talking about the day, but at the same time, you have to. Right. Right. Yeah, I mean, trauma is uh, it's like a cancer inside of you. Mm -hmm. you know, it just grows, and it'll, you know, one day you'll find yourself angry over nothing. Right. And, uh, you know, next day you find yourself racked with anxiety over nothing. Mm -hmm. Like, where is this coming from? <laughs> the next day you'll find yourself horribly depressed. Like, where is this coming from? Right. And that's, that's trauma trapped inside your body manifesting into these things. Yeah. Did you ever get therapy? Depends on what your definition of therapy is. Uh, every trauma is different. Mine is different from yours. Mine's different from my neighbors. Everyone has a different story to tell. Uh, my thing was I wanted to talk to someone who's been in the same scenario that I personally don't talk to on a regular basis. Uh, when I, What we did is we had a conference down in uh, St. Pete Beach, uh, Florida, Association of Aquatic Professionals, basically all aquatic directors across the United States, uh, Canada as well. They come down for a yearly event. They do our trainings. They say, what's any changes going on with our programs? Red Cross, Starfish, et cetera. And we do uh, webinars, workshops, and just to get to know any changes that, that, that some other facilities are using that we can piggyback and take from them. Uh, a few years ago, we had a training down in Frisco, Texas, and I got introduced to somebody. I saw him on YouTube. He's done a lot of uh, speaking engagements, and I just felt like he was like, the cool instructor, right. if there is such a thing. Well, he definitely is because he, he's Pete. So. But um, I talked to him. He did a uh, – uh, years ago, he did a leadership training for my for my uh, new uh, supervisors because some of my supervisors, this was the first time being thrown into a leadership position for their role. So I wanted them to know what exactly leadership is and what their expectations are. He checked into his uh, his uh, the hotel that we were staying at. He was probably walking over to his room, and I stopped him. He's like, hey, Pete, um, can I talk to you? He's like, yeah, Derek. Yeah, that's fine. Can you give me 15 minutes? I'm like, no. He's like, what's wrong? And they said that I need to talk to you. We got to sit down. It's like, all right. So I happened to sit down in a little area right next to a bar. And it says, what's going on? It's like, we had a drowning on uh, Labor Day 2021. And that's been like my number one train of thought the entire time. And I have nightmares. I had nightmares prior to that. And I was having nightmares well throughout it. And I just needed to talk to somebody. Uh, Pete is a uh, trainer t out in uh, San Diego, California. He's seen just about everything that you unfortunately can see. And I talked to him. I was expecting it to be like a five-minute conversation just to let him know what happened. That conversation turned out into an hour conversation. And 
I can easily say once I once I we stopped talking, I felt like this weight just was like taken off my head, and I never felt like that before. And I just, I without him, I don't, I probably should have got counseling earlier. I the drowning happened on Labor Day. I started talking in February. That's when you saw Pete. Yes, in February, and just that one hour conversation just like started like lifting that weight off of you. Yes, yeah, it's awesome. It's yeah. amazing. Wow. And, and when you said Pete did training out in California, what what type of tra- training for lifeguards? Yep. He does the uh, training for the ocean lifeguards, the uh, pool lifeguards. He does the training for, I believe they do basic water rescue out in San Diego for the, the Marines as well. They have a, a basic training out there. He's the one responsible for, for basically anything involving water. Pete's name is pretty much right on it. Okay. So what happens, you know, after this event down in Florida, you know, you go back to work and, mm-hmm. and what transpires from there? So I was worried that we were going to lose all of our guards from the drowning because I, I knew a bunch of guards were not going to be able to come back from that. So now you're in the off season. Yep. So they're probably, they're in college or they're, high they're in high school, yep. I mean. You're right. So now, you know, we're coming to the next season mm-hmm. and you're wondering like how many, if any, will come back. Yep. Yeah. So, what? so oh. uh, Pete gave me this idea, say, you have all your, your, your contact information. Like, of course I do. It's like, Call one of them once a week, different ones, five, ten minutes. Just talk to them. Just saying, don't talk about the drowning. Say, how's school going? Uh, uh, what colleges are you looking at? Uh, how's school? How the sports team's going? Just get them talking. And at the end, saying that uh, we look forward to having you back this summer. And I just want to let you know that you're applic- we're looking forward to seeing your application. And we actually had our largest uh, retention rate that year. We usually have we usually get about 70% of our guards come back. I think we had 83 re- 83% of our guards came back that year. Interesting. Yeah. You would think maybe the parents would step in and be like, mm-hmm. no, you're not going back to that. Yeah, and but, some did, and I totally understand that, too. Right, right. Yeah. Wow. Oh. And and how long did you continue on working there? I was there until, when did I get engaged? Uh, November of 2023. Okay. So uh, what happened was our facility was also at a uh, financial troubles at the time, still are. But um, even prior to the season, uh, we were doing uh, cutbacks on our staff, and I was livid because I remember we had the drowning, and then all of a sudden they want to talk about cut, reducing my staff just months after a drowning. It's like I'm being thrown into a meeting and saying, all right, we need to cut back our staff by about 40%. I'm like, Your staff being lifeguards? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. After a drowning? <laughs> yes. Wow. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and who, who whose brilliant decision was that? The general uh, manager? I'm not gonna throw names out as much as I would like to. I don't <laughs> feel like getting hit with a lawsuit, right? But at the same time, it was just they wanted to find ways to cut corners, uh, trim some fat. They wanted to reduce uh, guard hours. They didn't want guards at certain beaches where it didn't have as much atten- attendance. However, me being me, is I did a lot of research, and we happened. Uh, we we went through with it for about. Three weeks, maybe two weeks. With the 40% cut? Yep. Right. And then all of a sudden, we had a lot of rescues during that weekend. Really? Uh, it was a weekend right before uh, for the July, and we had 10 rescues in one weekend. Wow. And I knew all the board our directors on at our at the facility and said, I just want to let you know, we have, uh, we've had 10 rescues, and we probably could have had more if uh, we had some of these beaches open. So I'm starting to give it to them. And I, I got this. I would say words, but- we're in a healthy uh, podcast area right now, and I want to throw out some uh, uh, swear words, but <laughs> saying this is what's going on. And then when they decided it was right before Fourth of July weekend, and say, "Hey, we're opening up all the beaches. We're going to take it as a cut, as a financial loss." I'm like, not my problem. Right. So we opened up all the beaches. Well, I mean, you got to be talking a, a lifeguard who's a sophomore in high school is probably making minimum wage, right? Yeah, at the so, time it was probably you know, like thirteen dollars an hour, and right. minimum wage is up again. It, so you're going to worry about a thirteen. You're going to cut forty percent of your thirteen dollar an hour jobs yeah. to try to save money after having a drowning. Exactly, and the thing that was bothering me is I I know so many of the people in that air in Lake Mohawk. I could probably knock on someone's door, and they open up a door. I probably know who they are, and I'm just like thinking, you know. This drowning could happen again, and what's the probability of this being one of my friends or one of my friend's kids or one of their cousins, nieces, nephews? And it was just, like, haunting me. It's like I'm having this flashback of, of Labor Day and 
saying this is going to repeat itself. And then once we had the uh, once we got the okay to bring back to full capacity, I was like, what took so long? <laughs> right. It's like, is anyone listening to me? Right. I, th- I mean, it just sounds like complete insanity. Yeah. To cut the jobs you need the most. Right. You know, there's got to be some other where you can trim the fat. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. I mean, and you're you're playing Russian roulette. We are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank, thank God. I mean, you had ten rescues that one weekend, mm-hmm. and, and thank God you didn't lose anybody. No. Because a, a lawsuit would would have obviously brought out that they did a forty percent cut in their lifeguards. Yeah. And then what? Yeah, and the average uh, lawsuit settlement for a drowning in the state of New Jersey is uh, about one point five million dollars. Right. So not for nothing. Um, I'm not a finance major, but what would I rather spend on it? Would I rather spend a hundred and eighty five thousand dollars on a on lifeguards, or would I rather pay a one point five million dollars in a drowning and have our insurance skyrocket as well, right. or drop us too? And I, I mean, for for people who don't know, people you know all around the world will hear this podcast and. Mm-hmm. Lake Mohawk in Sussex County, New Jersey, is known as the ritziest part of the county. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so the ritziest part of the county is is cutting forty percent of minimum wage jobs right. to try to save money. Mm-hmm. I, I, that's just baffling. It was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, so you've you've already got this PTSD mm-hmm. that you're dealing with from the drowning and the trauma from it. And then I would imagine like this added stress is just like compounding inside of you with, with everything, right? Yeah. There's a reason why I don't have all my hair. <laughs> <laughs> Holy smokes. Um, so, you, so you go into the rest of the season, you, they hire back the needed staff. Mm-hmm. Um, and, then, and then what, you know, what happens with you with your job there? Yeah. So um, as I said before, I... And uh, t- what year were we talking about? Two thousand. What year were we in? Two thousand twenty-four. So two thousand twenty-two, twenty twenty-two. Uh, I met my uh, my girlfriend at the time, uh-huh. and we steadily realized that this is going to be more. And I decided that I was going to propose to her. So it was a. Uh, I believe I bought the ring in October, and I the day after I brought the ring, I was pulled into a meeting and says, "Hey, we just want to let you know we're in a lot of financial trouble right now, and we have to uh, let you go." We're gonna we'll let you come back in March, and says this isn't a performance review. It's just we're in a lot of financial issues right now, and we decided that uh, we have to uh, cut you for the time being. I just bought my engagement ring the, ne- the day prior. And what month is this? This is October. October, and they're saying we'll bring it back in March. Yeah, not happening. <laughs> right. Oh. So um, so I decided to say I'm gonna come up with a how to do my job, uh, S- S- SOP, standard operation procedure. Just in case where the next person came in who has no idea what to do because everything's in my head. Right. So it wasn't on paper. I put like 20 pages together just as an attempt, just one so I can get paid up until uh, December. And then I was going to use all my the time that I recruited from vacation time, sick time. So I was going to be paid up until probably about uh, January 1st, just so I had a little money reserved as well because I knew that uh, unemployment was going to take a while too. And right. I didn't realize how long I'm, I was going to be on unemployment for too. Um, I said before, I went back to school for cybersecurity. You're actually the reason why I went back to cybersecurity as well. <laughs> so uh, your uh, case, uh, when you spoke at Kittatinny High School, yeah. I was months away from paying off my, my student loan at the time. I paid off my student loan on Good Friday. So that's, my, that's, uh, that's how I view Good Friday as paying off my student loan. But um, <laughs> sorry, that's, that's kind of like a joke right there. <laughs> but um, <laughs> Uh, the reason why is I went back to school is you talked about how uh, state police got into uh, 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 Den- Dennis's uh, laptop and they found all this horrible evidence on his computer. The way you spoke about it, I always say that conversation is just a unique subject because you can say one thing and someone's going to translate it into another way. The way you said how state police uncovered this evidence it clicked in my mind saying, I think he's telling me something. And I just remember right after we uh, we left Kittany. I send you a message the next day and I say, hey, Clark, I love your speaking engagement and your story about uh, Dennis Pegg and how he how the police recovered his evidence and says, I want to go back to school for cybersecurity and I want to be able to track down these uh, these sex offenders. And I wish I could have been a fly on the wall to see your face. I'm sure it would have been like an Eli Manning look, face a deer in <laughs> headlights saying, that wasn't my objective. <laughs> but I... 
it's just like you, you changed me for that. And, oh, that's uh, incredible. I, trying- <laughs> I know you would send me all these messages on uh, Facebook Messenger. Yeah. You know, like, ah, oh, because of you, because of you, because of you. And I'd be like, no, nah, it's not because of me, bro. You're doing it. He, you're like, no, no, <laughs> you've inspired me to. I'm like, really? You're mm-hmm. like, yeah. Yeah. And I also say, too, um, uh, just I uh, get, uh, we'll get back into our story in a little bit, but. If I didn't go back to school, I would have never met my uh, my wife. Really? And uh, I saw that as a driving force on basically talking to you. It's because if I never went back to school, probably would have never met her as well. So I just knew that there was a better part of my life. And uh, without you, I would have never found that better part. That's awesome, man. I'm honored. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and uh, one thing I was not going to say before, but um, I, I we spoke about like an hour before we start, we got into uh, this room. Uh, when we, uh, when Sean and I got married, we put like a list together of uh, people who to invite. Uh, you were actually invited before my best man was. Really? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so if Scott's listening to that. Yes, it's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hope, uh, yeah. Maybe he'll tune out for this. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I remember uh, you sent me the invite, and uh, I said to my girlfriend, "I'm like." Wow. I go, uh, one of the jail guards who, who befriended me just invited us to his wedding. She's mm-hmm. like, what? <laughs> I'm like, yep. And I'm like, we got to go. I'm like, it's incredible. You know? So, uh, uh, you know, again, I was, uh, I was honored to, uh, to, to be at your wedding. Mm-hmm. And, and then, you know, like, you know, a couple, you know, people, you know, I was like the 500 pound gorilla in yes. the room. Cause I, <laughs> obviously you've talked to your friends about me yep. and then, uh, you know, I'm sitting at the table, you know, with whatever, like eight other people. Yep. And, uh, you know, I, I talk freely now. Like, yeah. I, you know, I, I used to be so locked in with my abuse and my trauma. Right. And I know you have to talk about it. And yep. so I talk freely wherever I go about it. And I started talking at the table about it. And then like one by one, I was like, oh, well, since you since you brought it up, can I ask you questions? I've been dying. <laughs> no. So, <I'm> like, <laughs> <laughs> so like one person after another. And then I, I think it was one of your, uh, maybe an ex-teacher from another table, he came over. Oh, nuts bomb. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. And he, he started. The guy that looks like a Drew Carey? Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. That's him. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> he came over and started asking questions. Yep. Uh, you know, which, which you, know, you, you know what I, you know, what was weird for me is yeah. when I got out of prison, I'm like, I'm like ready to talk about what the, the hell I just went through. Right. And my best buds, my family, they all shut me down. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, you know, nobody wanted to talk about the five years of hell I just went through. Right. No, they all thought, you know, like, uh, let's just let it lie, let mm-hmm. it rest. You know, you went through so much. And I'm, and I'm thinking, I go to my buddies, you know, like, you know, we're going out for a dinner here and there. And I'm like, don't you guys want to know what prison life is like or jail life is like? Well, we don't want to upset you. You've been through enough. I'm like... Well, I got to talk about it. <laughs> you know, like people just, people are get uncomfortable and, you know, they don't know what to say. And, you think and, they were scared to ask you something that would upset you? Or, yeah, they didn't yeah. want to upset me. Meanwhile, you know, I just made a post about this the other week. And, um, you know, I have a I have a, a, a girl I've met who is like majorly deformed in her legs using a walker. Mm-hmm. And... Instead of gawking at her week after week after week, you know, I, I I went up to her and I said, hey, would it be out of line if I asked you, you know, what the hell happened to your legs? And she was just like, thank you. Thank you. Finally. Someone <laughs> you <know>? said it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and she was thrilled to just tell me what happened. And, you know, then the same thing I saw you know, uh, this elderly lady at the gym who I used to work out when her and her husband always worked yeah. out, but I work out at a different time now. And I saw her the week before by herself. And then I saw her the other week mm-hmm. by herself. So I said, where's, uh, where's your husband? And then she just started crying. And I'm so sorry to tell you, he died a month ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then she went into her, you know, uh, 60 year love affair with him. You know, so people, People need to talk about it. I needed to talk about it. Right. I need to talk about it now. I, you know, uh, you saying that guy down at the convention in Florida, one hour talking about it, just like started to lift that weight off of you. And yeah. that's why I wanted to have you in today, just to continue to lift that weight off of you. Definitely. And getting through it. And I want to hear all different ways. From, yeah. You know, so how, what other steps 
uh, you know, so you so you get let go mm-hmm. um, at the end of that year right after buying a ring, and yeah. then and then what happens? You know, yeah. Where do you go from there? Uh, that was tough. I was unemployed for five months. I expected to be done within maybe one to two months. I they never called you back in March. Uh, I said I wouldn't come back. Oh, you wouldn't go back? No, I yeah. I tried to, and the, he just shot me down. I'm like I'm not dealing with this guy anymore. Okay. Um, I. Cut him out. I took him out of my phone as well. There's no reason to be in contact with them. I wasn't going to use them as a reference. I had other people for that. And then I was I was trying to get hired for everything. I had a degree in cybersecurity. I figured I was going to be a hot shot. I was going to get hired. That didn't happen. Really? So um, I, what I ended up doing was I started volunteering as well because I needed to get out of that house. Uh, being in that house, is like it felt like I was trapped and I couldn't go anywhere. So um, I initially had bought a membership for a YMCA a membership in Randolph, and I started working out there. I was losing a lot of weight. I was feeling good as well, but same time I was coming home at eight o'clock in the morning. And it's like you yeah, have the rest of your day, and you can't do anything. So I was uh, I can't say I wasn't doing anything, but I was applying and I was just being saying I would get the same email while we were impressed with your qualifications. We moved on to other applicants. Good luck in your future. Signed X Y Z. So what I decided to do is I wanted to volunteer at that YMCA. I felt very confident with myself being there, even if it was just like three or six hours a week. I just need to get out of that house. And uh, I initially applied for a position there, and I was a, uh, a finalist for it, but they decided to go with an internal candidate, which I kind of understood. And then I said, you know what? I really do like work. I like the YMCA environment. And I found another position up in Hardiston, and it's where I've been since. I work as a assistant aquatic director. I am I took a pay cut from what I did at Lake Mohawk, but at the same time, I just needed a healthy environment. Right. I haven't had that in a long time, and... It's nice to be in one, and I'm very spoiled to have that because, one, I have a good work environment, and I go home to a wonderful wife as well. So I'm in a much better situation than I've ever been in my life. You know, so many people get into that hole Mm -hmm. and that darkness and that woe is me, and then it compounds the anxiety, the depression, where's my life headed, Mm -hmm. and they just stay – they just keep sinking and sinking and sinking, and you realize, like – I got to get out of this house. Yes. This, this this isn't good for me just to be lying around. Right. Like, like demons are like grabbing me. Yeah. I got, and I got to, I got to be proactive a lot. And to your credit, bravo. Mm-hmm. But that's not what a lot of people do. Right. But you, you realized you had to do that mm-hmm. and, and exercise too. You know, right. you're, you're going to a YMCA working out and, and that's like one of the, one of the tenants I, I talk about for healing, mm-hmm. like, you know, you, you, you gotta, you gotta get up off that couch and you gotta start exercising. Yeah. You know, that's the greatest gateway to a new life. And you realize that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And just being in a comfortable environment, my mind's been exposed to other opportunities as well. I've been on a board for a family promise of Sussex County. Uh, they are literally right across the street from the jail. Remember when you leave the jail, there's that big, big church right across the yeah, street. Yeah. yeah. And right between the, the church is this brick building right there. Then there's another church. That brick building is where the uh, Family Promise is. I joined that facility back in March of 2019. I was brought in by my former English professor at Sussex County Community College. Her name is Julie Schuldner. Uh One of uh, her son was a guard at the lake years prior to the drowning. And she just remembered me as a student from uh, years ago. I said, hey, would you be interested in joining a, a nonprofit board? I'm like, great. I have no idea what I'm going to do, but. I'll give it a shot. Uh, it took me about a year to understand what a board member does and what we actually go through. But having been able to uh, work at a nonprofit, the YMCA, it's kind of really opened up my door saying, you know what? You did your cybersecurity degree to have a better mindset, to clear your mind, and have one, improve your grades as well. I graduated summa cum laude, 4.0 GPA. I worked very hard for that. And that's hard to do. And I kind of use that as a stepping stone saying, because what I'm looking to do right now is I submitted my application to Rutgers University the other day. I think it was uh, last Wednesday when I finalized it. I'm looking to go into a master's in public administration with a goal of one day being an executive director for a nonprofit organization. Awesome. You're doing the things you have to do. You know, you could have just, why didn't you stay complacent? I didn't know any better. Yeah, I was, one, I was scared to disappoint you as well because I spent all, <laughs> <laughs> I really was. <laughs> Because um, there were times where I was getting ready to, I almost dropped my major because I couldn't understand some of the assignments that were going on. It's like, all right, I'm going to drop my major. But first, you're going to have to tell Clark saying, 
Clark, I know you inspired me to go back to school, but now I'm letting you know that I'm dropping out of school because I couldn't understand Python for one day. Thanks for motivating me, but I couldn't do it. I couldn't do that to you. Was that really in your head? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> there was an assignment. <laughs> I was losing my mind. I went, uh, when, uh, when we had stimulus checks, I used my stimulus check to go down to Spring Lake for a week because I was just so stressed out about school. And as I said before, this great thing is all from stress as well. Uh, for those who are not watching me on camera, there's a good ball patch I'm <laughs> brewing right now. <laughs> so um, I went I went down to Spring Lake just to deal with, uh, get rid of the stress as well, do homework, just to get out of a different setting as well. And I just I just knew there was so much more to my life than working in that Lake Mohawk. Right. I mean, if I was there still, I would never left. And I just think that would just be a, such a disapproval to myself. I know I can do better. And I think being let go now that I'm happy about it and talking about it as well, I was like, I need it. I need to be gone. Right. And I've ran into people at the YMCA who who are members of Lake Mohawk as well. They love that I'm ha happy again. They were just seeing – I always just had this look the entire time where I just looked – I just hated being there. Right. They saw that, and they seen me with a smile. I'm like, it's nice to see you healthy again. Right. And these are some of my friend's parents that I've known for a long time. They knew that stress was bearing me down from the drowning because it was always with me. But just seeing that I'm doing other things now that working for the Y, my mind's healthy. I'm able to do. I'm able to attend board meetings. The Y to and going to Newton is like all 15 minutes away, and there's other opportunities with the Y. It's not, I'm not going to sit in that same position forever. It's one that just that's not who I am. I know that I can do better with my life. Right. And um, I've looked at other positions. I'm hoping to hear back soon. And if they don't get hired, good. All right. I'll find something better. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's tough to get through that people, you know, a door closes, yeah. but there could be five other ones ready to open. Right. You know, and just to stay stuck, like staying stuck as a jail guard, yeah. you know, like miserable. Staying stuck in a job just because you're afraid uh, of, uh, you know, losing that paycheck and mm -hmm. what will I do and that. Your life is precious. Mm -hmm. Life is short, man. You gotta, right. you gotta, you gotta take advantage of opportunities and and not being just miserable, right? Like, like, and what kind of husband would you be? Just miserable every day, coming home to to a new marriage. Yeah. You know? And my wife would be like, "What the hell did I get myself involved in?" I know I should have went for the cousin when I had the chance. Yeah. <laughs> He was so happy-go-lucky when That's I right. met him, and now it's all the cards have fallen. What is this? <laughs> so, so good, man. I mean, so look, you know, the last guest I had on, you know, it's just showing tools right. to help people. Yeah. So the tools I, I gather from you is one, you got to speak. Mm -hmm. um, two is get off the friggin' couch. Right. Three is get some exercise. Mm -hmm. Four is change your environment. Mm -hmm. Five is donate your time, yeah. and it'll change your life. Yeah. Speaking of uh, donating your time as well, I don't remember if you saw that at the wedding. Uh, we had this at uh, – I forget what these things are. My life is going to go postal when she hears this. But uh, we had, like, instead of, like, uh, giving us money, we wanted to, you to donate money to an organization. Part of that money was going to uh, Family Promise as well. <laughs> so instead of in lieu of gifts, we want to you guys to extend money to an organization. So my wife at, – at, we did like a 50-50 split. She donated to an organization, and I donated to Family Promise as well. I mean, you're talking about, yeah, 500 bucks. But it's 500 bucks each that one that, that an organization didn't have to begin with as well. And we're just at our life where we're comfortable. We understand where the, where the value of this money is going for, and we're passionate about it as well. It wasn't just throwing $500 to say, oh, great, good tax write-off. That's not how it was. We wanted to help those people as well. Donating your time, that's exactly what we wanted to do as well. And Without people like you at the wedding, we weren't able to make those donations. Oh, awesome, man. Oh, I'm, I'm glad it went to good use then. Yeah. That's awesome. Anything else uh, you want to share? Do you want to tell people like uh, who are struggling you know, with, with anything with PTSD that you went through? Anything else you want to uh, cover? Yeah. Uh, don't be afraid to let the silence sing. It's okay to talk to people as well. I try my best to hold on to it, but it's not a healthy thing to do. Awesome. There you have it, everybody. Another episode of Free Like Me. I hope Derek came on. And I, how do you feel now? Did I feel, better? yeah, I feel like I got another uh, weight off my head. So, there you, go. you want to go to the gym afterwards? Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tell you, people, you know, if you're holding on to secrets, you're holding on to trauma, 
it's it's a weight inside of you it's a poison inside of you you have to get rid of it whether it's 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 being involved in a drowning like Derek was or sexual abuse or addiction or whatever free yourself speak your truth and free yourself take care everybody bye